Hi. So today we're going to be talking about uh, some related concepts uh, having to do with the arbitrage theorem and uh, pricing stock options. Uh, so to start off, what are stock options? So stock option is uh, basically the option to purchase a stock uh, in the future at a set price. So there's uh, two different uh, prices here really. One is the price of the option, you pay that up front to then later on have the option uh, to buy the stock uh, in the future and that price is set uh, from the get-go. Uh, so what we're interested in uh, pricing here is this initial option. Uh, the price later on will just be uh, fixed. Um, so to give a simplified example of how this works, uh, say at starting time, time T0, uh, the price of the stock, say whatever is listed on the stock market, is $100 a share. Uh, so you can buy or sell X shares of that stock. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can also buy or sell options to buy Y shares of that same stock at $150 per share at a later time, call it time T1. Uh, so the options at time T0, which is what we're interested in figuring out, are the uh, cost C. So what should C be set at? Uh, we see that there's a difference here of $150, but we don't know what that stock will be worth at time T1. So uh, what can we do about that? Uh, so for the simplified example, we will say that at time T1, the stock will have either gone up to $200 or it will have gone down to $50. Uh, so just two distinct uh, uh, things that can happen there. Uh, so your total value of all of your holdings at time T1 for this stock will be 200 times X, which is uh, uh, the amount of stock you own times the uh, value at time T1, plus uh, this difference in the value of the uh, stock and the price you would have to pay to exercise the option times the number of options that you bought Y. Uh, that's if the price goes up to 200. Now, if the price goes down from 100 to 50 at time T1, then uh, basically you wouldn't exercise the options at all because you would be paying uh, money to get something worth less uh, than what you're paying, which wouldn't really make sense. So you just omit the Y term, uh, the options are just worthless at that point, and uh, the value of what you have is just uh, the value of the stock times the amount of uh, shares of stock you bought, so 50 times X. Um, so in practice, there's a lot more to consider here. Obviously stock doesn't just go up or down to one of two prices. Uh, there's many other things that work here, uh, but for now we're gonna uh, keep things uh, to this simplified level. Uh, so now how do we determine C, what the price of the options uh, will be? Uh, so first off, uh, to simplify things, we will pick quantities of X and Y that uh, a person is buying so that uh, they'll end up with the same amount regardless of which of these two uh, outcomes happens. Uh, so set these two equal to each other. Uh, these are from the previous slide. This is the value of uh, all of your holdings under either scenario. Uh, then we get y in terms of x. That gives uh, y equals negative 3x by some uh, simple algebra there. Um, so now, uh, one side note here, what is the meaning of negative x, having negative shares of stock? Uh, so that means basically that you're selling stock at time uh, t0, uh, if you were to have negative x. Um, so basically this is clearly just a little uh, linear uh, equation here. So there's many different things that can satisfy this. One of them, uh, buy three options and sell one stock. Y equals three, X equals minus one. Uh, that would make that equation work. 
Another thing you could do would be selling six options and buying two stock, y equals negative six, x equals two. Uh, that would also satisfy this equation. So there's uh, many different uh, behaviors you could do that would give you the same result regardless of uh, which outcome occurs. So now, how uh, should we determine what C, the price of an option, uh, will be? Uh, so we decided to make things easier uh, that we will set uh, Y and X to satisfy this relationship uh, just so that regardless of which outcome happens, the return will be the same. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but it just makes uh, this example easier. Uh, so uh, a couple things here. The total original cost, the price you're paying at time zero for whatever you uh, choose to buy here, uh, is going to be the cost of your stocks plus the cost of the options. Uh, so that's 100 times X, that's for the uh, stock, the current price, times the number of shares you're buying, plus CY, the uh, cost of the options, times the number of uh, options that you're buying. Uh, and in this case, because we know this relationship is holding, that ends up being minus 3XC, where Y is just uh, minus 3X. Uh, so then the total value at time t1 we know is going to be 50x uh, and that's because from the previous slide we set uh, it so that 50x will equal 200x plus 50y regardless of which outcome uh, occurs. So uh, we're basically using that to eliminate the uh, y term. That's uh, why we set uh, <laughs> this relationship here. Um, so the gain that you'll get is going to be that total value 50x minus the cost at the outset. Um, so 50x minus 100x minus 3xc. Uh, that uh, simplifies to x times the quantity 3c minus 50. Uh, so now uh, you can tell it's uh, two uh, things multiplied by each other here. Uh, the gain will be zero when this term, 3c minus 50, equals zero. Uh, and that's the case when c equals 50 over 3, or about $16.67. Now, if the price of the option c is priced at anything other than this amount to make the expected gain zero, an investor choosing what to buy here uh, can always make their gain positive by uh, how they choose uh, X. So if C is priced at more than that amount, more than 50 thirds, they will just choose positive X. Um, this value here will be positive. Their X is positive. Their gain, therefore, will be positive. Uh, if C is priced at lower than 50 thirds, uh, this value here will be negative. Uh, they choose their x to be negative, and uh, their gain, once again, is positive. So this means that if you're the one setting the price of the option, uh, you should choose or must choose c to equal uh, 50 thirds, or else there's a sure win investing strategy. And that is what is known as an arbitrage. Uh, so arbitrage is a term that typically is applied to pricing assets like stocks and so forth uh, traded on markets. Um, like we just talked about, uh, arises when the prices are set so that someone can make a combination of trades that guarantee a profit with no risk. It's a sure, uh, sure win. Uh, now, economists say if a market is efficient, then there is no opportunity for arbitrage. Uh, that's one of the definitions involved in an efficient market. Um, so here's another uh, example. Say uh, an exchange uh, in country A uh, prices gold at $1,300 an ounce, and uh, a different exchange, a different market in country B prices gold at uh, 1325 per ounce. 
Uh, now, if somebody is aware that both of these prices are uh, this way, you could uh, sort of take advantage of this uh, discrepancy by gold in price or in uh, country A at this price, take it over to the market in country B, sell it at this price, uh, and you're guaranteed to make a profit. And normally, keep in mind, it's important to uh, realize normally there would be a risk buying uh, gold at either price. Uh, you're hoping that the price is going to increase rather than decrease. Uh, so by doing both of these trades, a buy here and a sell here, you are uh, getting rid of that risk. Uh, so now uh, to get into a more formal definition of uh, arbitrage and ultimately going to the arbitrage theorem, uh, we need to define a few terms here. So um, for a particular, you could call it investment, game of chance, whatever it is we're studying here, uh, there are M outcomes, which are results that, that can occur. There are N wagers, which are uh, ways that you can bet, uh, which are not necessarily the same as outcomes. For a given outcome, you may wager for it, against it. Um, you may wager on uh, different combinations of things. Uh, but usually there's a relationship there, but they're not necessarily identical. Um, and then there's a return from each wager on each outcome, uh, given by a return function r sub i of j. Um, and then also for each uh, wager, you can bet a different amount that's going to be an x sub i, uh, and that can be positive or negative uh, for buying or selling. I uh, believe we talked about that uh, a few slides ago. Uh, so then a betting scheme is a vector x of the amounts bet on each wager. So uh, you have you know x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub n, meaning you're betting uh, this x sub 1 amount on the first wager that's possible, x sub 2 on the second wager, and so on. So you're making uh, different simultaneous bets basically. Uh, then the return from your whole betting scheme uh, x uh, is going to be the sum of uh, the amount that you wagered for each wager i times that return for the outcome uh, up to n, which is uh, all of your different wagers. So now to give an example of uh, these concepts of outcomes, wagers, returns, uh, and also uh, betting schemes, uh, we'll look very quickly at a simple example of uh, roulette, but won't spend uh, too much time on roulette. Uh, so the outcomes uh, are each spaces on the wheel that uh, the ball can land on. There's 38 different possible outcomes. However, uh, wagers are different than those. They are based both on color and number, can be different combinations of numbers actually. Uh, so they could be things like saying black or number three. Uh, now the casino sets a return function uh, for uh, each wager and outcome determining what payouts you'll get uh, if you made that wager and a certain outcome uh, occurs. Uh, so for example, wagering on a single number like three, uh, the return for that is going to be 35 times what you put down. Uh, wagering on a color returns uh, two times whatever you put down. That's the return function for uh, saying black or red. Um, now we're going to say for the sake of argument that a casino allows multiple bets on one spin of the wheel. I'm pretty sure that's not how casinos uh, operate with roulette. I think they just let you make one bet. Uh, but uh, to give an example here, a uh, betting scheme could be saying $10 on black and uh, also a wager of $10 on uh, number three. So then the return from this betting scheme, uh, this is just uh, the same uh, uh, 
formula that we had on the previous slide, uh, it would be uh, sum of your two wagers. Uh, you have x sub uh, i here, or uh, for the first term, x sub 1 is $10 on black, uh, so you get the return uh, function from black uh, as a function of whatever the outcome is, and then plus x sub uh, 2 for, uh, which would be $10 also, uh, times that return function for 3, and this R3 here uh, is a little confusing. I put it for the number 3, not because it's uh, uh, sub 3, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's actually uh, really R sub 2, but uh, notice that there's black down here rather than sub 1. Uh, so anyway, uh, the this is also a function of the outcome j. There's going to be just one outcome, and you'll get uh, returns based on that outcome. Uh, so if the outcome j is a 3, uh, which happens to be a red space, uh, your first wager, you will get nothing. There's no return there because you said black. Uh, and then you do get... Uh, that 35 times payout of your uh, wager for the second wager. So that's uh, $350 uh, total return there for that betting scheme. Uh, now, uh, side note on roulette before we move on, uh, casinos set payout rates so that uh, their odds are always fixed against a player. So they give you a payout that is less than the odds of winning. Uh, and that's because there are uh, spaces zero and double zero that you don't get payouts on, uh, whereas they set the odds as if those did not exist, basically. Um, so uh, this will come up later. This will play into uh, what we're talking about with arbitrage. Uh, but we'll just note for now that if you were allowed to bet, uh, make a negative wager, basically bet against things happening, you could guarantee yourself to make money just by betting against uh, particular outcomes because you know the odds are stacked uh, against you. So now we move on to the arbitrage theorem. Uh, so for a particular thing that we're studying, uh, such as an investment or a game of chance, or in general, we can just call it an experiment, exactly one of these two things is true. Uh, either there's a probability vector P, uh, which uh, is a vector equaling P1 up to Pm, uh, for which uh, the sum of the probability P sub i times the return uh, function sub i of j equals zero for all i uh, from one to n, or there exists a betting scheme uh, vector x equals uh, x sub one up to x sub n, uh, for which the sum of this, remember this is our uh, return function basically for the betting scheme, is uh, greater than zero for all uh, j from one to m. So basically, unless uh, this probability vector exists, uh, that would give a condition where there can be arbitrage, which is uh, if you're the one setting prices, you usually want to avoid that. Uh, so we'll talk more about uh, what this means and uh, how the uh, probabilities come into play. Uh, so in part one of the theorem, uh, we multiply the return for each outcome by the probability of that outcome, uh, which is what probability vector P is. Um, so from that, we can get the expected return for that probability vector, which is the expected value under uh, P of uh, that return function. Uh, so informally, uh, the theorem is saying that either the expected return is zero for every wager, that's the that first part, uh, going back this part, the expected return, which is just uh, the probability times uh, the return, if you remember the definition of expected value is just, for a discrete case, 
is just the sum of the probability of uh, each thing times the uh, value of the function at that thing. Uh, so either the expected return is zero for every wager, uh, so this expected value equals zero, or else, uh, part two of uh, the previous slide, there's a combination of wagers that guarantees a positive return for any possible outcome. That is uh, from that previous slide, uh, this part right here. So now we'll move on. So how to prove this? Uh, I'm not going to give the full proof. Uh, it uh, involves different disciplines than what we're talking about here and would uh, you know, sort of be on the scope of uh, what we're discussing here. So uh, just sort of outline uh, where this comes from. Uh, so if you think of a betting scheme that maximizes return, uh, to maximize this return function we've been talking about, uh, and then say, is that greater than zero? Because if it is, then we know that there is arbitrage. Uh, so basically, we're trying to maximize something. Uh, this is a essentially a linear uh, equation. This is an optimization problem, uh, and the proof of this ends up coming essentially out of uh, linear programming. Uh, so the objective function, the, which is the function we're trying to maximize, uh, is basically this. Um, and in an optimization problem, there's always uh, constraints on what these values of x can be. Uh, and the solution to uh, this optimization problem will be a vector of values x uh, to optimize the objective function. Uh, so now here, uh, we need to rely on the duality principle of linear programming um, in order to get this proof. Um, basically, the du uh, duality principle says that any optimization problem can be viewed as either the original, which is called the primal problem, or an equivalent dual problem. So the, pro the primal problem here, uh, what we were just talking about, uh, is maximizing an objective function cx uh, subject to uh, an upper bound constraint. So x can't be any bigger than this. There's a limit on what x can be, which is b. Uh, and so how do we maximize this function given these sort of limited resources, if you want to think of it that way? Uh, the dual problem rephrases that uh, so we're trying to minimize an objective function b y. Uh, here we're taking the same b, which was the constraints before, uh, which is now the objective function, subject to a lower bound constraint uh, on uh, y, where y is a dual vector. This is where we're getting beyond the scope here of what we're talking about. So not going to get too much into this. Uh, the key thing here is that now the constraint of the dual uh, problem was uh, from the original objective function uh, and vice versa. So we're basically swapping the objective function and the constraint in a certain way. Um, now, uh, the objective function of the dual is a linear combination of the constraints of the primary problem. So the solution of the dual, which is uh, what we're going to be getting here, is the smallest values of the constraints uh, b from the primal that still includes the optimum value. So this is how we're going to look at the constraints uh, on, uh, going back to the previous slide, uh, we're going to figure out how to constrain uh, this betting scheme, which is basically, uh, you can think of it as setting the price for uh, uh, the different uh, outcomes and wagers. So uh, now applying this back to arbitrage, uh, we want to ensure that there are no sure win bets so that this uh, uh, return equals zero. Uh, 
the known here is the objective function from the primal uh, problem. Uh, and we know the maximum. So we have this objective function. We have the maximum is zero. If it goes beyond zero, then there's arbitrage, which is what we want to avoid. The unknown we're trying to solve for is the constraints on that uh, problem that will correspond to this maximum. Uh, so we will think in terms of the dual problem in order to find those uh, constraints to this problem. Uh, you can think of the, like I was just talking about, the primal was a wagering problem. Uh, how much should I uh, bet on each x? Uh, and then the dual is a pricing problem. So we've turned it into a pricing problem, which is what we're uh, ultimately trying to get at. Okay, so if we set the constraints in the dual problem, which is the uh, pricing problem, th that way of formulating things, so that the expected return equals zero, uh, then we get the first part of the arbitrage theorem that we saw, which is that there exists a probability uh, vector p for which the expected return equals zero. That's uh, setting the pricing or setting the constraints uh, so that uh, uh, that is zero. Now, uh, if we don't set the constraints this way, then we can uh, consider the primal problem, which is the wagering uh, way of looking at things, uh, which will give the second uh, part of the arbitrage theorem. There exists a betting scheme X for which uh, the expected return is going to be greater than zero. Uh, and part of the proof is that these two possibilities are mutually exclusive, that uh, you know, uh, either this or this, uh, and that's by other results in linear algebra, which we, for uh, uh, the sake of this lecture, will just uh, take as fact. Uh, and it has to do uh, with uh, these two being basically disjoint sets in n-dimensional space, if you think of uh, these as being n-dimensional uh, shapes uh, of sorts. Uh, you can prove that those two shapes are separated by a hyperplane. Uh, and that is getting uh, definitely beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Uh, so we'll keep moving on. So uh, we're going to give an example of uh, the arbitrage theorem through uh, wagering on odds of an outcome. Uh, this is something that comes up a lot. We uh, saw it, uh, uh, that brief example of the roulette wheel. Uh, comes up in sports betting or horse racing where uh, you might say a team has two to one odds uh, against them. Um, so just to uh, give a definition of what odds means as compared to probabilities, which we see more often, uh, one to one odds would mean that the probability is uh, one divided by uh, the two different things here, one plus one, uh, so that's 1 over 2 equals uh, 0.5 probability in that case. Uh, so more generally, if you say that there are O sub i to 1 odds, uh, the probability that would correspond to that is 1 over O sub i plus 1. Uh, and in this sort of odds wagering, uh, the odds set by the house directly determine the payouts that you get. Um, so that means that uh, the return function r sub i of j will just be uh, if you win, if your outcome j is the same thing as what you wagered on, uh, say you wager team a wins and then the outcome is team a wins, then your return is just going to be that uh, odds amount. So if it's two to one odds, you'll get a payout of two times whatever you bet. Uh, if it's one to one odds, you'll just uh, get a uh, payout equal to what you bet. Um, and then otherwise, if i is not equal to j, then you just lose uh, one. 
So uh, that's just whatever is on the other side of the odds here. Uh, you could imagine this being something other than one, uh, say three to two odds, but we're just gonna, for sake of simplicity, consider O to one odds here. Uh, so now from the arbitrage theorem, uh, the only way that there can be no sure win betting strategy for someone out there making a bet, uh, there must be a probability vector P uh, for uh, probabilities for all the different outcomes for which the expected return under P uh, equals zero. And uh, we know from the definition of expected value, this is going to be uh, each probability. Uh, so either uh, probability of your desired uh, wager occurring times your payout uh, plus uh, uh, your what happens if you don't win, which is uh, you lose one, and the probability of that happening is one minus uh, the probability of the outcome actually happening. So that's uh, one minus p. Uh, so to keep working on this example, uh, for there to be no sure win bet, this was from the last slide, uh, the expected uh, return under probability vector P, uh, which equals this amount that we just saw, uh, has to equal zero. Uh, doing some algebra here uh, and solving uh, for each P sub I, that ends up being uh, one over O sub I plus one. Uh, and that should look familiar because that was our corresponding probability from the previous slide uh, right there. Uh, so we know that the sum of all the probabilities PI must equal one. That's how probabilities work. They must sum to uh, one or else something's uh, seriously wrong. Uh, so uh, we can say the sum of the P sub I from I equals one to M, which is all of the different outcomes, uh, or which also we know equals uh, this here from uh, solving for P sub I, uh, that must equal one. So the arbitrage theorem says that if the odds posted do not uh, match that, uh, meaning the expected return is not equal to zero, then there is a sure win bet that someone could make. There is uh, arbitrage. Uh, so one such betting scheme uh, is going to be uh, each X sub I, each uh, where I are the different wagers, the amount you bet on each wager is uh, one uh, over one plus uh, O sub I, so basically the probability of uh, that particular thing happening, divided by the sum of all of the probabilities. So keep in mind, uh, normally this would just be divided by one, but here uh, this is going to be something other than one because uh, we know that this was uh, set in a uh, way that doesn't add up to one. So uh, to illustrate this, um, say a case with uh, m equals three, so three possible outcomes, and they post these odds for these different outcomes. So say this is whatever you wanna say, horse one wins the race, horse two wins the race, horse three wins the race. Only one of those three things can happen. Uh, and they give you these odds for those different events. Uh, so we can tell very quickly that uh, the probabilities associated with these uh, one half here, one fourth here and one fifth here do not add up to one. They add up to 19 twentieths. Uh, so we know that a sure bet is possible. Um, now in practice, you have to be able to do both negative and positive uh, bets uh, to, for this to work in every case. Uh, in horse racing, that may not be happen or that may not be possible. Uh, so you have to have a setup where you can make a bet with somebody to go negative or positive. Um, so uh, in this case, we're going to use an approximation of this uh, betting scheme. We'll just use, uh, we'll round things off to make uh, uh, 
whole numbers come out. Say you bet $52 on outcome one. Simultaneously, you're betting $26 on outcome two and 21 on outcome three. That's your betting scheme, which is that vector X. Uh, you can see below the return will be positive for regardless of which one of these outcomes happens. So if outcome one happens, you make $52 from wager one, you lose uh, uh, these amounts on your on the second and third wager, but you still come out ahead. Uh, same with outcome two, you make uh, money on your second wager, you lose money on your first and third, uh, but you still come out ahead. Uh, likewise, for outcome three, you make money on that third uh, wager, lose it on the first and second, but uh, because of the way the odds were determined, you once again will be guaranteed to make uh, a return. Uh, so now going back to pricing stock options, uh, so how does this all tie in? Uh, recapping what we saw before, uh, the current stock price was 100. We're calling the current option price C and the option was to buy stock in the future for 150. Um, the two wagers you can make in this case were to buy or sell stock and to buy or sell options, buying and selling, as we talked about, corresponding to positive or negative. Uh, so the two wagers are stock and options. Uh, there's two different outcomes that we saw in that case before. Uh, one outcome is the price goes up to 200. The other outcome is the price goes down to $50. Uh, so let P be the probability that price goes up to $200. Now the arbitrage theorem says that uh, in order to make it so that there's no Sherwin betting scheme, uh, there must be a probability vector for the outcomes, uh, there being only two outcomes in this case, P and one minus P, uh, that make the expected return of both wagers equal to zero. Uh, if we can't find that P, then uh, there will be arbitrage possible. Um, so for wager one, which is for the stock, uh, what value of P gives an expected return zero? Uh, so your return is going to be, uh, if the price goes to 200, it'll just be uh, 100 minus, or rather 200 minus 100, that's the future price minus the price you bought it at, equals uh, 100 per share. Um, or for outcome two, the price goes down to 50, uh, you will basically lose $50 per share. Uh, you now have $50, you spent $100, that's minus 50. Um, so the expected return, uh, we've seen this uh, term before, the expected value under P of the return function uh, for each wager I uh, for the out each outcome J. Uh, that will be 100 times the probability P of uh, the price going up to 200 minus uh, 50 times 1 minus P. So that's uh, if the price goes uh, down to 50. Uh, those are the two different uh, possible outcomes there. Uh, so then solving for P, uh, and then setting it equal to uh, zero because we want the expected turn, uh, return to be zero uh, to satisfy the arbitrage uh, theorem. We get P equals one third and uh, one minus P equals two thirds. So that gives us our uh, probability vector P, one third uh, for it going up to 200, two thirds for it going down to 50. This is the only probability vector that 
will give it a uh, expected return of zero for the way you're on a uh, stock. Um, so now in order to price the option, when uh, does this also give expected return of zero for wager two? Uh, so we have this uh, probability vector still. Uh, the return for wager two is going to be 50 minus C. Uh, if the price goes up to 200, that's because uh, we have uh, stock is now worth 200. Uh, the option price was 150. So you make $50 per share, uh, but you had to pay C at the outset uh, for each option. So you end up getting a net total of 50 minus C. Uh, for outcome two, the price goes to 50. Uh, you just get minus C. Uh, we talked about this the first time around with the uh, options example. There's no uh, uh, nothing else here. You're not actually buying the options because they're worthless at this point. Uh, so there's no negative term uh, in front of this. It's just whatever you paid for the options and then you call it a day. Uh, so the expected return uh, for this second wager is going to be P, probability of price going up to 200, times uh, the return under that scenario, 50 minus C, plus the probability of uh, the price going down to 50, which is one minus P, uh, times the return under that scenario, which is minus C. Uh, so now, just like in the last uh, case, we want to set that equal to zero and solve for C. Uh, we just do some algebra here. Uh, we end up finding that uh, C equals 50 thirds, uh, which is when we did this previously, what we found also. Uh, so from the arbitrage theorem, pricing the stock option at 50, uh, 50 thirds, which is about $16.67, is the only price for which there is no sure win. Uh, and when you price things this way, then there does exist a probability vector P for which the expected return of all wagers is zero. So uh, now in the real world, things are not that simple. Uh, we are, you know, arrived using the arbitrage theorem at uh, a result here that we got uh, just algebraically before, not even knowing about the arbitrage theorem. Uh, so in reality, uh, one key thing that we talked about before, the price of a stock is a continuous function of time, x at t, uh, which varies randomly. Uh, it's not just going to go to one of two discrete values. <laughs> Uh, and we need a way to model that also. Um, the wagers are in real life, you know, you can buy or sell either stocks or options. Uh, T is not just one fixed time in the future, however. You can buy them and sell them at various points in time. Uh, that's something to take into account. Uh, also, somebody could offer uh, multiple different options to buy, uh, each with their own cost. Uh, at a different price. So say you could offer uh, for, in the previous case, we had, uh, you know, for 50 thirds, you can get it for 150 in the future. Somebody could also say, uh, uh, if you want to pay more now, I'll give you a lower fixed price later or vice versa. Uh, you could imagine something like that occurring. Uh, one other really big thing to consider is the time value of money. Uh, so uh, when an investor is making a consideration on what investments to make, they need to think about how receiving an amount in the future is not worth as much as receiving the same amount now, because if you had that amount now, you could just invest it somewhere else uh, and earn interest on it. Um, 
And so uh, we're going to assume that you get continuous compound interest uh, with an interest rate of alpha. Uh, so the present value of a stock at time t is going to be x at t, but then we need to multiply it by this, which is via the uh, compound interest. Uh, so to say that the expected return equals zero uh, is a little bit different than what we were talking about in the previous example. It means that there's no return versus what you would have just gotten putting your money somewhere and earning uh, interest at the prevailing interest rate, which was alpha. So uh, we still are looking for the prices uh, C for the options that will make it so that there's no arbitrage possible, no sure win uh, betting strategy. The general strategy is the same as before. We need to find uh, essentially uh, constraints or a probability vector, although if uh, we're looking at continuous uh, case, there won't just be a vector of uh, prices. Um, and we're looking to give an expected return of zero for all the wagers someone can make of uh, buying and selling both the stocks and the uh, options. Once we've uh, done that, once we've set the expected return to zero, then uh, we'll find uh, what C must be. Uh, and there's not actually just one way of doing this in practice, there's multiple ways. Uh, one that we're going to look at uh, briefly, I could go, there's way more depth to this, but we're just going to touch on it, is the Black-Scholes option pricing formula. Uh, and this was first published in 1973. So in the grand scheme of things, relatively recently, although now that is uh, some time ago, but definitely not, uh, not, not all that long ago. Uh, and this method involves uh, Brownian motion, another topic that we are only going to very briefly touch on uh, way beyond the scope of uh, uh, what we're uh, going to go over here, but we'll, uh, we'll go through it quickly. Okay, so to satisfy the arbitrage theorem, uh, as we've been talking about, uh, we want the wager of paying price C for an option uh, to have an expected return of zero. Um, so uh, the worth of an option at a future time t is just going to be, as we saw before, the price of the stock at time t minus the price to exercise that option, which is uh, big K. Uh, before this was uh, uh, 200, minus 150, uh, now it's going to be x at t, which is a function of the price, minus big K for cases where uh, uh, the stock is valued more than the uh, option exercise price, uh, or like before, if the stock is now worth less than the option exercise price, uh, the option is worthless and uh, you just wouldn't exercise it. Uh, so we'll refer to this as x uh, of t minus k uh, with a little plus symbol to indicate that if it were to go negative, which would be uh, uh, in this case, you just wouldn't do it and uh, you would only get a lowest value of zero there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so uh, we do need to consider, this is just the uh, worth at time t. We're now considering the time value of money, so we need to multiply this amount here by the uh, continuous compounding uh, factor here, e to the negative alpha t, alpha again being the uh, interest rate, uh, to get the uh, present value. Now the expected return of this uh, is going to be, uh, keep in mind there is a, a, a random variable here, x of t, so it's the expected value of this under some uh, probability measure uh, 
so uh, that's your basically expected uh, uh, return, but you have to consider that you also are paying C upfront for this, so uh, minus whatever that is. Um, and then uh, setting the expected return equal to zero uh, basically can move C over to the other side of the equation, so we get this uh, equals the uh, C, which is what we're looking for. So that's good, we have something in terms of C, uh, but we still need information about X of T and also the probabilities in order to, uh, the probabilities of the different outcomes that can happen uh, in order to solve for C. And that is where we use uh, the Black-Scholes uh, method, which involves uh, Brownian motion to describe that uh, function of price. So, uh, we're going to use the probability measure governing this stochastic process, x of t equals uh, little x sub zero, which is the initial stock price, times e to the yt, where yt is geometric Brownian motion. Uh, so we don't have uh, time to get into all of the details of uh, this. Basically, Brownian motion is a continuous case of a random walk. Uh, we talked about a uh, random walk in class uh, at some point. Uh, at each unit of time, uh, you can either move up or down one unit. Uh, here, this is a continuous case. It's the limit as uh, those random increments get smaller and smaller. Uh, geometric Brownian motion, which is what we're using here, uh, also includes a drift coefficient mu and a variance uh, sigma squared. So uh, this is just a quick graphic. You can imagine this is, looks like you might think uh, prices uh, for a stock rising generally over time. There are some uh, dips, but generally there's a trend uh, that they're following. Uh, this is for uh, different uh, variances, different sigma squares with the same uh, uh, drift coefficient. Uh, and y of t is going to give a normal distribution. Uh, let's keep moving. So, uh, putting everything together and summarizing, we're solving for c, which is the expected value under uh, certain probabilities of outcomes, for uh, the expected return, keeping in mind we're uh, taking time value of money into consideration. Uh, and here, this x of t, we're now going to plug in this value, which uh, is that stochastic process for uh, uh, involving Brownian motion that we just saw. Uh, and uh, this will satisfy the condition that the expected return of the option is zero. Uh, also, like uh, in the previous cases we saw, earlier throughout this presentation, uh, we have to satisfy the condition that the expected return of buying the stock is zero. Um, we could get a different uh, expected return. This is the one for the option. Uh, the one for the stock would probably actually be actually uh, simpler. Uh, but we're going to omit all of the different steps involved in this and uh, just take a look real quick at the uh, formula. So, C uh, ends up being uh, the initial price times uh, the initial stock price times phi, where phi is the cumulative standard normal distribution function of uh, sigma root t, t being the uh, time that you're exercising the option, plus b, b being uh, equal to this value here, minus k, k being the uh, option exercise price, again, this is where uh, that time value of money comes into play, uh, times phi of uh, at b, uh, which is that same value down here. So there's quite a lot going on here. Uh, basically, the price of your option is going to depend on a couple of factors here. The initial price of the stock at time zero, the option uh, exercise time, t, the option exercise price, of course, uh, the interest rate factor, uh, how much uh, 
doing something else with your money would uh, be expected to give you because you need to know that for uh, to figure out what your expected return would be. Uh, and then uh, sigma squared, which is that parameter of the Brownian motion that we saw before. Uh, and uh, the mu, the drift factor, doesn't come into play here, only uh, the variance uh, there does. So uh, let's break this down a little more. What are we actually talking about here? Uh, so on each side, essentially what we're talking about is the reward minus the cost. We have one term uh, minus here, one term that is positive, this is basically the initial stock price times, uh, you can think of this as the expected benefit of purchasing the option. Uh, and then minus, this is going to be, uh, you know, what it costs you to exercise the option, that big K that we saw before. Uh, and then we need to multiply by this uh, factor uh, to get the current cost of uh, paying the uh, price. Um, and this formula is set so that the expected return will equal zero for all wagers on options and stock, uh, satisfying the arbitrage theorem, uh, which is no mean feat to make sure that the cost you were paying up front will give you an expected return in the future, given that prices will fluctuate according to uh, the uh, model of Brownian motion that that expected return is actually going to be a zero. And that is what this formula uh, will do. So that's uh, the end. Here are just a couple of uh, references. Uh, the textbook uh, by Sheldon Ross, it was the uh, main framework. Uh, a couple of internet resources that were very helpful. Actually the Wikipedia page on uh, linear programming and duality. I uh, found that very interesting <laughs> to delve a little more into the proof of the arbitrage theorem. And then also just to get a better understanding of the Black-Scholes model, uh, the article on that at uh, investopedia.com was also very useful. All right, thanks very much. I hope you found this uh, interesting.